Just when you think that maybe you got a shot at keeping up with all the language the PC police are putting out, they change it again. Or better yet, they come up with a guide just so you don't screw up. Apparently, they have all the answers, all those smart people there. Stanford University wants you to know what you can say and what you can't say. <laughs> We're going to dig into this. It's insane. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. I am Trish Regan. Portions of today's show are brought to you by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest for the long haul in things like precious metals. So go to the sponsor's website. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com. Again, LegacyPMInvestments.com to learn more. <laughs> so Stanford University out this week with, you know, the Bible here, the guide to what you can and cannot say, at least at Stanford, on their websites. The goal was to clean up all the websites with this guide on what is acceptable for language nowadays. It's scary because now you're going to have computers sifting through the internet, at least on Stanford's website, to see if, oh my gosh, did anybody say this? Did anybody say that? And then you've got AI coming in, artificial intelligence, and they're going to block that stuff. And so at what point does this become the norm, I guess, across the entire Internet? I think they would love to have it be the norm across everything. And we've seen all kinds of evidence of suppression and manipulation by these algorithms in the past. We don't have to get into the Twitter files, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, let, let's, let's start with Stanford here because they've got this project, which is known as the Elimination of Harmful Language Initiative, E-H-L-I. Just, you know, just so you get all the, the, the terms down. E-H-L-I, they call it. Did you know what was a harmful word? This one takes the cake. American. <laughs> the word American, the term American. That's harmful, says Stanford. It's imprecise. It, it needs to be instead U.S. citizen. You're not American. You're a U.S. citizen. And they write, and I quote, American often refers to people from the United States only, thereby insinuating that the U.S. is the most important country in the Americas. Noting that, of course, the Americas includes 42 countries between North and South America. You got Central America. You got Canada up there. You got Latin America, South America, I mean, you, you got a big continent, right? So when we say we're American, well, shouldn't that include everybody in Brazil and Mexico and Canada as far as the PC police are concerned? But I think at this point, we've just kind of recognized that, yeah, you know, we kind of are the most powerful economy and country in the world, including in the Americas. And culturally, it's just been come to be that we say we are American. We are American. We're not Canadian. We're not South American. We're not Latin American. We are American. And, um, well, <laughs> as you can see, the world has gone insane. And now terms that we've used our entire lives are considered harmful or racist or violent or biased, according to Stanford. It gets even better because I, I got more words that we can't say that I think you're going to kind of get a kick out of disturbingly get a kick out of. But before we do, just a shout out to my good friends over at AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, working hard every day so that some of this nonsense doesn't fully overtake our culture. Um, it's just a great group of people, more than 2 million strong, I should point out. And they're actively trying to promote good, strong economic policy so that we can manage this inflation, hopefully a little bit better. I mean, our country's been clearly in a whole lot of trouble. I think you can say that both from an economic standpoint and a social standpoint. And so AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, is trying to change that. It's kind of like I say the AARP with a little bit more of a conservative bent because you get all kinds of benefits and freebies and travel discounts and good stuff like that. Um, it's $16 a year, so you'll make that back in no time. But the other real advantage of it is, and, and by the way, in addition, you know, I like this to the financial planning aspect that they will help provide you with and options on healthcare. What I like about it is it gives you a chance to work with over 2 million people, Americans, that probably think a lot like you and me. So go check them out. It's amac, A-M-A-C dot U-S slash Regan, my last name, amac dot U-S slash Regan. You know, they're not going to like this thing. I, I, I know them over there in this E H L I doesn't want you using the word American. They don't want you using other terms. Now, this is interesting because some of them, like, you know, you kind of 
you have to scratch your head and say, wait, wait, which can I use? Other listed terms include immigrant, which should be referred to or replaced by, quote, person who has immigrated. <laughs> you can't say immigrant. Instead, hey, you know these academics, why not use more words? You have to say a person who has immigrated. I'm not so sure that I <laughs> understand the difference there. Hey, you know, again, why use one word when you can use four? You've also got non-citizen. You can, you can say non-citizen to avoid referring to people by single characteristics. So you're a non-citizen. Gosh, I'm really, all right, there's other stuff in. You can't say beating a dead horse. Oh, because it normalizes violence against animals. <laughs> Good luck with that one, guys. Good luck. Uh, the purpose of the website is to educate people about the possible impact of the words we use, the guide's preface reads. By the way, they had to like lock the thing because people were obviously having a lot of fun with it and poking a lot of fun with it. And um, well, they had to lock it down so that word wouldn't get out. Apparently, you just have to be in the club to know now what you can say and what you can't say. Anyway, the New York Times had a very interesting follow-up, which didn't reference the Stanford stuff, but was a look at some of the expressions that we are supposed to use, but perhaps we don't, and some of the journalist reactions at the New York Times. I'm going to get to that in just a second. But before I do, um, a quick shout out again to my friends over at Legacy Precious Metals. I don't know if you're watching the market today, but we saw a, a heck of a lot more volatility. I do expect that we're going to have a more challenging time ahead. You've heard me say this over and over and over. I, look, I, I just tell you what I think. And about two and a half years ago, it would have been the summer of 2020 when I first started this podcast. I warned that we were going to have massive inflation. It was going to lead to a whole host of economic troubles. And I didn't have full faith and confidence in the Federal Reserve. By the way, Jerome Powell, appointed by Donald Trump. I I'm super, super disappointed in the guy. I, I had hoped that he had a little bit of real world experience that he would have lent to the job. I don't know how much pressure is on him. Don't forget his old boss, Janet Yellen. She's now Treasury Secretary. She works for Joe Biden. I'm disappointed in her as well as an economist. She's gotten so political, and I hate to see these economists out there like political hacks with their transitory nonsense. I'm telling you, inflation was never transitory. You've got to be five steps ahead of these people because they're not doing what's right for our economy and our country. They're doing what's right for them. And I think Jerome Powell just wanted to keep his job, and he's got Biden and Yellen saying, hey, you know, we got to keep the spigot open. Will you keep that spigot open? You're going to be exactly in the situation that we are in right now as a nation dealing with mass inflation and now increasingly a more stable economic environment. So all that said, all the more reason to go check out my friends at LegacyPMInvestments.com, 1-866-589-0560, 589 because if you're like me and you want a little safety, a safe haven in your portfolio for the long term to kind of even out some fluctuations as well as hopefully preserve the value of your dollars, the purchasing power of your dollars anyway, gold is one of those things that might just be able to do it. I mean, it's not perfect. Nothing's perfect. Nothing is perfect. But over time, it has held its value. So go to LegacyPMInvestments.com today. Turning back to this fun story, <laughs> it's... I know we're laughing and I'm having some fun with it, but it's actually really, really disturbing. Let me get to the New York Times piece because they did this little quiz and they, they polled people to see what they said and what they don't say. And, you know, there's all these special words like you're supposed to say BIPOC now. Do you know what BIPOC means? <laughs> BIPOC, I mean, you're thinking bi, right? No, it's actually the Black Indigenous People of Color. And it's a term that was sort of created on college campuses but it's kind of got a ways to go, and the New York Times admits it, right? Because apparently nobody's using it. Like, really, nobody is using it. Because nobody knows what it means. Um, <laughs> then you've got AAPI. AAPI. Do you know what that one is? Asian American Pacific Islander. So you've got to be very specific on this stuff. There's also Latinx, which no one's using especially Latinas themselves. Look, I, I speak Spanish and I can tell you that Latinx sounds very different than Latina. If you're trying to refer to women, then you would say Latinas, right? And part of the reason for that is, hey, the entire language actually has masculine and feminine nouns. I don't know what they're going to do here. 
we're going to have to reinvent French. We're going to have to reinvent Italian. We're going to have to reinvent Spanish. Because guess what? Everything has a gender assigned to it in these languages. So we say la mesa. You would not say el mesa, <laughs> unless the table's a little confused, or el meso. <laughs> you would say sobre, sobre la mesa, like on the table. And that's just how the language is constructed. So if you ask me, I actually think when we're trying to reinvent all this stuff and we're saying things like Latinx, we are putting down these Romance languages themselves that have feminine and masculine nouns. And it's strange to me. I think Latinx was created by somebody who clearly didn't speak Spanish. And they thought this was the answer. Talk to a lot of Hispanics and proud Latinas. They'd say, this is a little weird. And again, back to the BIPOC thing, it, the X thing makes everybody sound like maybe you're, you're gender confused. I mean, some other fun ones for you as we go into the holidays here. Global South. That's interesting. So we used to say third world. And when I was at Columbia University, that was, you know, and by the way, a lot of this stuff, as I said, gets born out of these Ivy League universities, Stanford being a good example. But I can remember hearing, don't say third world, don't say third world. It's developing, developing world. We're the developed world. They're the developing world because third world implies that they're somehow not enough. I'm not even sure if that's the proper terminology anymore because now I'm reading about low income. Should you say that? Should you not? Oh, what's wrong with low income? And then, of course, there's the, the global south, the global south that they want you to use. Well, 85% of the population is not using that. <laughs> Just wild stuff, illegal alien, totally out, totally out. You're not allowed to say that. African-American black, I don't know. I guess black is what you're supposed to say now. You're not supposed to say African-American. You can't keep up. I don't want to keep up with it. We shouldn't have to keep up with it, now should we? And so while we laugh about it, I think that this is actually of real concern. When you can't say pregnant woman and they want you instead to say a birthing parent, I'm sorry. Like until science does some really wild stuff, last I checked, it was just women that could give birth. So therefore, women are breastfeeding. But this is, you can't say pregnant woman. You can't say breastfeeding women. It's birthing parent or breastfeeding person. Women are being marginalized in all of this, really. Like they're trying to chip away at anything we got going on that's kind of special because we're just going to make everybody the same and totally generic. And you saw the Canada story recently. Male skaters now can compete against female skaters, I guess, bringing that movie with Will Ferrell and uh, what was his name from Napoleon Dynamite to life. <laughs> the two male skaters dancing on ice. I, I was actually speaking recently with a former Olympic skater and she the, um, inclusive person who probably does use the term BIPOC, but she was concerned for her sport. She said, look, women are not, it's just not possible. They're not as strong as men. So when everybody can compete against together, together in something that's going to make it much more challenging. We need to center ourselves <laughs> over the holiday season and remember not to allow the insanity to take over. And part of that means recognizing that we've got to be more cautious with artificial intelligence. So now if the bots are going through the Stanford website looking for these terms and they're going to automatically change them, does that mean that any website that has these terms is going to run into jeopardy? And are we running into this kind of censorship that's frankly filled with a whole lot of nonsense and detrimental to half the population? It's not right. It's not fair. Quickly before I go, because um, I see him over there. I see him over there. He's, he's like very sleepy looking though, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bug him. You know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Fluffy, my lovely, beautiful little Maltese. And he's still eating rough greens. I talk about it every day because it's so important that we take care of ourselves, we take care of our portfolios, and we take care of our loved ones, including our pets. And Fluffy is my little pet. I've had him for several years and he's just doing great. He's got a beautiful, fluffy, silky coat. And I attribute part of this to his health and the nutrition I provide him with. A, a wonderful guy, former army ranger, Dr. Dennis Black, naturopathic doctor, came up with a supplement for dogs that you just sprinkle on top of their food every single day, once a day, just a little bit, 
on top of their food. It makes the food taste fantastic. If your dog doesn't like to eat, this is a game changer, I promise. And he came up with this because he wanted his dogs to be healthy and to get all those nutrients and not to just be dependent on what he would tell you is that dead food on store shelves. We need to make it come alive with proper nutrients, digestive enzymes, all those good things. So Fluffy loves his rough greens. I know your dog, if you have a dog, will love it too. So go to roughgreens.com because Dr. Black has a very special offer right now, a trial offer, free, totally free. I think you just have to pay for shipping. Go to roughgreens.com, get your trial offer today, and let me know how your dog likes it. Okay, we're going into the holidays. We've got a big show coming up tomorrow. Actually, I'm thrilled. My friend David Limbaugh, brother, by the way, of Rush Limbaugh, um, David Limbaugh and his daughter, Kristen Bloom Limbaugh, they are out with a wonderful book, a wonderful book that celebrates Christ and celebrates this season to take both a sort of historical look at things that brings it up to present day, as well as a very spiritual look at things. So I, I'm so excited to talk to them about their book. Tune into tomorrow's show for that. Meantime, go to trishintel.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll see you tomorrow. Encouraging us all to really have a stronger relationship with God, whatever that